Well, hey guys, it's Dr. Drake 63 here again today, and uh, we're going to take a look at Smith & Wesson Revolver's old versus new manufacturing. There seems to be a lot of opinions out there, some of them informed, some of them not, about the differences between the old and new guns. MIM versus forged triggers and hammers. Lock versus no lock. Pinned versus non-pinned barrels. Recessed versus non-recessed cylinders. The list goes on and on. The finishes, how are they different? Everything. Today I just want to talk about some of the differences. I'm not going to obviously get into all of them. That would be an exhaustively long video. But I'm going to talk about just some of the differences between the, the older stuff and the newer stuff. Ideas out there that they don't make them like they used to. And that part is very much true. They don't. In some ways, that's a positive. There's some newer, stronger materials that are out there. In some ways, it's not. Less hand fitting, more automated processes, and maybe a little bit less attention given to detail. So you've got some older firearms, you've got some newer firearms, you've got dash this, you've got dash that. And today I just want to talk about a few of those differences, point out a few of those differences to look for, and show you some resources where I get some of my information. I'm on a learning journey when it comes to all the firearms that I put my hands on and I expect you are too, so stay tuned. And just some of the differences between one version to the next. And we're gonna start with what is uh, best known as Dirty Harry's 44 Magnum. It's the 29 slash two, dash two, I should say. And um, the first thing you're gonna see on this right here, where, where my thumb is, this is what's called a pinned barrel, okay? So you're gonna hear that a lot when you talk about Smith & Wesson barrels, pinned. And all that means is, is that this barrel screwed in to a point to where that uh, it lined up and then what generally made sure that it was really lined up was this pin going across the top. And that cuts across the top thread of this barrel as it goes into the frame. Okay, so that's pinned. So you hear that a lot. Pinned barrel. Okay. The other thing you're going to see is what's called a recessed cylinder. And basically, if you look at the side, you can see that this is counterboard. So the cartridge rim itself of the case is going to sit flush with the back here, which can be a, an aid in terms of head spacing. And you uh, uh, can have a little bit more cylinder material inside the same frame side because it can sit back a little bit farther. Okay, So you hear about pinned and recessed kind of being the gold mine uh, of a Smith & Wesson firearm. This is pinned and recessed. This is a Smith & Wesson Model 29-2. This particular one was made in 1980. And this is an end frame. Okay. If you want to get this firearm today, you can get a new version of it in the Classic Series. It's not going to be a pin barrel. It's not going to be a recessed cylinder. Uh, and in addition to that, it's not going to... Uh, um, or it's going to have a lock right here, the, the, the uh, famous is what's called Hillary hole, which to show you the 586 is right there, okay? And I can guarantee you, most of you guys watch and nobody's gonna say, yeah, I really like that. Some guys will say they don't mind it and they can deal with it, but very few people are gonna say that they like it. But while we have this one out, you'll see here for comparison purposes, this is flush right here. You don't have counterboard cylinders or what's called recessed, okay? So that's one difference you're gonna see. Another difference you're gonna see is this is what's called a MIM, which stands for Metal Injected Molding, okay? That's what the hammer and the trigger are. If you wanna compare that, this hammer right here, is case color hardened forged metal. So that's a solid P3 
piece of metal that was milled down to this shape as opposed to being poured into a mold that is the shape of this hammer. Something else we'll show you between the older and the newer. You see here, this has a firing pin which is mounted on the hammer itself, okay? So the firing pin goes right in. You're gonna see that same scenario here. This is a Model 19 dash six. It's mounted right there. And this also, um, this is also a part that is case color hardened. You see here, this is a model 686. It's also a pre-lock. Uh, this one is a 686 dash five. The other one I just showed you was a 66 dash five. The inside right here of the frame here, you'll see the serial numbers on these. And that's true on any modern Smith. This is from 1990, okay? So one of the differences you're gonna see between that and the 66 dash, I'm sorry, the 19, model 19 dash five, is you'll see that this has a frame mounted firing pin, okay? So the firing pin's actually spring loaded within the frame and what causes the ignition is this hammer, which is a MIM part, comes into contact just like that. Okay, so that's some of the differences. And you'll notice outside of that lock that this new 586 is pretty much the same thing. It's got a MIM hammer and trigger. It's got the frame mounted firing pin. And there you have it. So a lot of folks are gonna tell you that they believe that the, the quality of this kind of generation Smith & Wesson uh, revolver versus this, which is that 586, I guess if I was doing this right, I would arrange these guys like this for chron chronological purposes. But they'll tell you the difference between these, these older Smiths, a no dash, a dash two like you have here, even, you know, a dash five. There's guys, their jumping off point's gonna be whether or not it has a firing pin mounted on the, on the hammer. There's other guys that are gonna say that their jumping off place is when they started making these parts out of metal injection molding. And still other guys are gonna say their jumping off part or their jumping off place is when you start seeing the appearance of the locks. Now, as you can see, I obviously don't have a jumping off place with any of these firearms because I have them all. And um, I like them all. They all, they all have uh, very nice merits on their own. I like the finishes they're putting on uh, this new classic series. It's like a mirror, kind of reminds me of the old Colt Python. However, having said that, I kind of think that uh, this blacker kind of blued finish that you see on this 29-2 is, is pretty, darn, pretty darn elegant and more reminiscent of what I think of when I think of Smith & Wesson. Here you've seen this. This has been somewhat of a project gun where I've, I've come in and, and re-blued a completely scratched up side plate and uh, the rest of the gun's got a few challenges here or there on the finish, but man, is this ever just a really sweet trigger. It very nice lock up, does everything it's supposed to. So um, that's not my best looking Smith, but uh, it's the one I'd probably be most likely to throw on my hip. Um, looking at uh, looking at this 686 with a four inch barrel, right there with it, right there with it. Um, this is a, a, a very, very both nice looking gun with these Altamont grips. It feels great in hand. So, you know, no problem. And this new 586, I really like it. She and I are really getting to know each other. Um, it's what I'll call neoclassic. In other words, you have this new version 
of a, of a target style grip. Coke bottles, I've heard them called, whatever. Versus these older versions. So I say Neo. Um, it's got a much better looking uh, Smith & Wesson emblem coin, if you want to know my opinion. But there's guys that are like, nope, I just want the classic. I just want the classic. So there's, there's something here on this table for anybody that's into Smith & Wesson revolvers. If you're like me, I, I'm thrilled to have all of these and, and my other ones as well. Uh, but when you talk about comparing Smith & Wesson throughout time and dash this, dash that, and yeah, I'd jump all over this. You couldn't catch me with this with a 10-foot pole. Uh, here's, here's my opinion. And this is just my opinion. Um, when they were making these guys, it was more about skilled craftsmen and, and, and high degree of, of uh, hand fitting processes, high degree of quality control. And back when they were making these, it was before the, the whole Glock and the whole semi-auto polymer thing hit. And, you know, Smith with their m and series is as much that as anybody. Well, you get into today, and uh, now I've seen statistics that indicate that semi-auto loaders are outselling a revolver something like 40 to 1. I've heard 50 to 1. Depends on who you talk to. Um, but, you know, this, this isn't the staple for Smith & Wesson, not in terms of volume, maybe in terms of tradition, but in terms of where they're making most of their money and everything else, it's not off revolvers, guys. So these are being made, you know, in a different, in, different world, different environment. There's a lot more automation. I think, and what I've noticed, and I've shown pictures before, I'll throw one up in a minute, um, Certain things like clock barrels and things like that just shouldn't be leaving the factory. Just shouldn't be leaving the factory. I don't know how that happens. So that's my, that's my gripe there. You'll notice this front sight does not line up with the channel on the top of the frame. So you might say, well, it's the big deal. Well, it's about two degrees shy of top dead center, and that results in about two inches left at 21 feet. Now, if you've watched a couple of my recent videos, you've seen this new K-Comp, which is a K-frame uh, version, a 3-inch barrel, 357 Magnum, and it's a carry firearm, specifically made for carry. And as we look at this and compare this to the finishes we see even on the Classic Series, or any of these other firearms, it's pretty matte, it's pretty dull. If I had a 28-2 to show you, it would be most comparable to that. Well, I've had some folks actually make the comment upon seeing pictures of this, well, I don't really like the finish. It just looks like cheap paint, so forth and so on. Guys, this is meant to be a carry piece. This is meant to, to ride in a holster. It's meant to have a durable finish on it. It is not a classic Smith & Wesson firearm in that, you know, you've got a ported barrel, you've got an illuminated, uh, you know, Trigicon sight on the front. It, it's different, but what it is, it's K-frame. Just like this model 19 right there. It's a K-frame with some modern changes, better better forcing cone, stronger forcing cone, things like that. So out of all of these that you see before you in terms of what costs the most to me is this guy right here, this performance center. And, you know, it's going to be a while before I can tell you, yeah, performance center is worth the extra money and here's why. I'm just being honest with you. Um, Probably in terms of actual value, this thing right here is worth more than any of them, but who knows? Depends on what you like. But when people talk about, well, Smith doesn't make them like they used to, as far as the quality, as far as the trigger, as far as timing, lockup, all the things I look for in a revolver, this new 
K Comp Carry in 357 Magnum is the best you're going to see out of these four below it. In other words, this is a very higher quality firearm, or I should say very high quality firearm. So when people want to rip Smith and say, well, hey, they're just making crap now. No, they're not. I will, I will refute that big time. But I also know that not, not all of their stuff coming out is performance center quality control. Not all of it is performance center fitted, everything else. So, And I've heard stories of people that say they've had performance center stuff. They had to send back. But I'll tell you what, guys, um, no matter what, what particular era your Smith & Wesson comes from, if it's functioning correctly and you take care of it, they're great guns. You got to clean them. You got to lube them. You want to definitely keep your forcing cone clean, but they're great guns. And doesn't matter whether it was something that was purchased in 2019, something that was purchased in 2018. Doesn't matter if it was something that had a born on date in 1980, if it had a born on date in 1990, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're good firearms. I'm a big Smith & Wesson fan. If, if there was the proliferation of Colts that there used to be, I'd, I'd be on board with more of those as well. I'm just not going to spend the kind of money that people want for a python or a snake gun. Uh, I believe those are extremely overpriced for what you get. Something else I'll tell you that's nice about these Smith & Wessons. I really love these Colts, but if I develop any kind of an issue, like for example, I've got some, some end shake on the cylinder of this six inch Colt Trooper Mark III. Um, if I want to get that fixed, I'm looking at about a seven to eight month wait right now. Colt doesn't work on them anymore. Just to get it looked at and the only way to really fix cylinder end shake, which is going to happen to any firearm you shoot enough, the only way to fix that is via uh, some stretching of the of the frame or the yoke. There's only a few places that can do that. It costs an arm and a leg. If I get some end play on any of these firearms, I can put a, a part, a washer that costs less than three bucks with, uh, with an install job on the rod going into the yoke and the cylinder um, that just about anybody with mechanical aptitude can do and fix that with a part that costs about three bucks. Like I said, any, any firearm, especially shooting 357 Magnum, 44 Magnum, any firearm over time is going to develop some looseness and some other things. And if you want to keep them going, what do you have to do? So definitely it's a lot easier to get an old Smith than it is an old Colt. It's a lot easier to work on and maintain and get parts for an old Smith than it is an old Colt. I've got nothing against these guys though, especially this guy right here, this four inch. Love this firearm. One of my favorite reference uh, places for Smith & Wesson information is Wikipedia, whereby you can go in and just enter a particular model number. It'll give you some basic overview information like years of production, so forth and so on. And then you have the options of looking at different styles and variants. And if you go to variants, you can get some pretty decent detail about the various dash revisions. You hear that mentioned so much and uh, does a really good job of chronicling the history of the firearm for you. Another favorite resource of mine is the Smith & Wesson Forum, which has a lot of various topics that are highlighted. You can look up things, for example, questions on J-frame grips, uh, things about repairs, you name it. It's very detailed. One of my favorite resources, like I says, and it's smith-wessonforum.com. Knowledge is power, guys. Listen to people who know what they're talking about. I try to. I don't claim to be an expert, but uh, I try to listen to them as much as I can. Anyway, thanks for watching. This is Dr. Drake, 63. 
so long.